Hello, Petra Lewis here. I'm going to talk to you about breast ultrasound indications, technique, and a few of the common findings. So here's my learning objectives. I hope by the end of this, you'll be able to identify most of the indications for breast ultrasound, be able to optimize patient positioning and the scanning techniques, adjust 2D and Doppler settings to optimize your images, apply the BIRADS ultrasound lexicon to image interpretation, describe some of the normal and abnormal common imaging findings on ultrasound, and then finally describe common pitfalls in breast ultrasound imaging. So let's talk here about the indications for diagnostic ultrasound. This lecture is not talking about screening ultrasound. Probably the most common is to interrogate palpable abnormalities, the patient or the patient's clinician has identified, or patients with focal pain, not diffuse pain, not generalized pain, not waxing and waning pain, but one finger pain. We often want to differentiate solid from cystic lesions in abnormalities that have been identified from patients screening mammograms. If we have a MR abnormality or some other type of mammographic abnormality, such as an asymmetric density or an area focal um, architectural distortion. Patients who have uh, unilateral spontaneous or bloody nipple discharge, we want to evaluate that in the retroareola area. Patients with mastitis to exclude an abscess. There are many reasons we might want to evaluate axillary nodes. Um, perhaps it's patients who have palpable nodes or have uh, large breast cancers or have nodes that are visible by some other means of imaging, such as MRI or mammography. And then finally, to perform ultrasound guided biopsies and needle localization, um, I have separate movies on that. So we're not going to talk about those further. Let's go through how we position the patient. I'm going to show you an image in a minute. You're going to have the patient's ipsilateral arm up and in a comfortable patient for, position for the patient to hold. If necessary, put a pillow under it if people have shoulder issues. You generally want to cover the contralateral breast so the patient doesn't feel too exposed. And then you're going to put the patient in either a left posterior oblique or a right posterior oblique to um, get that lateral breast tissue flat. If the patient, if we are interested in the axillary area or the far lateral area, then put them in a decubitus position. And what we're really trying to do by this is limit the dependency of the breast and to thin it out as much as possible. If we're kind of um, battling with more dependent breast tissue, it gets much more ch challenging for imaging. You want to be able to use sufficient probe pressure to compress the breast. Um, in my experience, um, trainees often don't use enough pressure and there is no such thing as too much ultrasound jelly. So here's our patient appropriately positioned. I would obviously have that entire uh, right breast exposed to be able to scan her adequately. She's tilted up a little bit, so you're going to have her LPO to examine the right breast. You're going to have her a little RPO to examine the left breast. So the side that you're examining, you want to tilt slightly um, up. We have her right arm up. The left arm can be down. Um, don't forget to do this. It makes a huge difference to how you're scanning the patient's breast. Generally speaking, we're going to do a limited breast ultrasound focusing on the quadrant of interest. Um, we don't tend to do whole breast ultrasound if we only have an interest in one particular quadrant. Tends to get yourself into a lot of trouble if you do that. So um, I'm gonna, there's different ways of doing this. I tend to scan quadrants um, initially in the transverse and the longitudinal planes. So just to show you how I do that. So we're going to have sweeps across a quadrant. Notice how they're overlapping for each sweep and I'll go across transversely. And then I'm going to change to longitudinal and I'm going to do the same again over the same quadrant longitudinal. And this is just as a you know, screening looking for abnormalities. Obviously, once I find an abnormality, I'm going to focus down on that. And I think of this as sort of a lawn mow method that you're sort of mowing the lawn, you're going across and you're overlapping each of your scanning planes. The other way to do this is to use your probe in a radial. You can see here on the left hand side of the image orientation versus an anti radial here on the right side of the image. And this is because ductile structures in the breast have that radial configuration. 
Um, and so lining up with the ducts may help you with looking at certain abnormalities such as DCIS or papillomas or ductal ectasia. I find it a little bit more difficult personally than, um, than using transverse and radial to try and get those overlapping um, uh, sweeps of the probe. So I tend to start with the the transverse and the longitudinal and then when I find an abnormality I'll change to the radial and anti-radial projections but to, just to show you this so we can do similar sort of overlapping sweeps in the radial and the anti-radial projection shown like this they just seem always a little bit trickier to me to get coordinated now we always describe where the lesion is positioned using a couple of different identifiers here. One is the clock face identifier. So we pretend that the breasts, as you're looking at them, are a pair of clocks labeled like this. And we'll say that a lesion is, for example, at um, two o'clock or 1.30, wherever that is. And then we're going to describe the distance from the nipple. Now notice this is the distance from the center part of the nipple, not the distance from the areola. So by using this clock face, you'll notice something important here. If we're looking at the upper outer quadrant on the left, that's going to be 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock, where the upper outer quadrant on the right is 9 o'clock to 12 o'clock. Very easy to get those confused, so just always double check yourself. Now, what are the absolute minimal image requirements that you should save? Notice these are minimal. You can save as many images as you want. And I um, nearly always will save or ask the text to save some cine images. I think they're very helpful. But you need to have a grayscale image, both in the radial and anti-radial projections or transverse and longitudinal, if you prefer. You need to have a uh, the lesion with measurements. Again, grayscale, radial and anti-radial. You want to have a color image in at least one plane. And then, as I said, I think that adding grayscale, cine, radial, and anti-radial as a minimum is extremely helpful. Note, when you're taking measurements um, in both the radial and anti-radial planes, or the transverse or longitudinal, if you prefer, that the measurements are relative to the long axis and the short axis of the lesion, not of the imaging box. So they're shown correctly on the left and incorrectly on the right. So you're going to get your three orthogonal measurements, length, height, and width, shown like here. If the longest measurement of the lesion is in the anti-radial projection, then you'd have to flip-flop those two images. And similar if you're doing them in the longitudinal and transverse planes. All right, so let's think about some of the hardware and software settings to be able to optimize breast ultrasound. You need a minimum of a 12 megahertz linear probe. I like very much using an 18 hertz um, linear probe for superficial lesions and thinner breasts. Um, you can use this to adequately scan down um, to a maximum of about three centimeters. You know, it's kind of best at around two with compression, don't forget. Um, so we'll use it on all thinner breasts. Um, all um, hardware comes with specific breast settings. They may or may not be to your liking, and you may want to tweak them and save an institutional um, setting. And this is going to include usually as a default spatial compounding or Sonos CT, it's called uh, various different things. Um, the ability to add harmonics if you need it. I don't have them on as a default. Your color Doppler will need to have a low flow setting. And you always want, when you're putting the color Doppler on, to reduce that um, box size to the lesion side to improve your um, sensitivity um, the best. So don't have a color Doppler box that fills the whole um, frame. You want to reduce it down to the lesion. And then have the ability to obtain power and spectral Doppler as needed. You want to set the depth so that you can just see the ribs at the bottom of the um, image um, in larger breasts, you may need to adjust it so that you can definitely see pectoralis. And this is to start. So this is when you're looking for an abnormality. Once you find an abnormality, you're going to optimize your parameters so that your focal zone is set on it and you reduce the depth accordingly with, with more superficial lesions. The gain should be set such that the breast fat is a mid-gray. This is really important. It's about equivalent to what the liver looks on a um, normal liver ultrasound. 
um, set your gains so that you have homogeneous penetration down to the chest wall and then move the focal zone to the mid uh, portion of the image until you find something and then you're getting to set it to the area of the um, interest if you find a lesion and adjust your depth coordinate. So if you have a lesion that is um, the breast here, here's the chest wall, you have a superficial lesion when you find it once to interrogate it and take further images you're going to want to reduce your depth so it only comes down to just below that lesion you want to put your focal zone right at that lesion so it's a different setting so when you're just scanning across the breast seeing if you can find an abnormality when you want to be able to see the chest wall back here and when you actually find a lesion and the same if it was a deep lesion then you'd be wanting to set your focal zone all the way down here I selectively use harmonics. Um, when you put harmonics on, it increases the um, contrast of the image, and this could be helpful. It can help increase the visibility of calcifications, or sometimes if you're looking for clip, that can help you there. It can help clean up cis by taking out some of the artifactual echoes. Um, be very careful, however, in this situation of um, triple negative cancers, which will have flow inside, but can appear remarkably um, hypoechoic or even anechoic. You must adjust, adjust that gray scale to make sure that you've still got the fat as the mid gray if you put on harmonics. And it can also improve the visibility of um, larger breasts, uh, particularly of deeper lesions. So just as an example here, um, showing you harmonics and no harmonics. By the way, the to see, this is on our particular um, ultrasound unit, we only know that we have harponics on by that little H sitting in there. Um, obviously check your particular uh, scanning device to see how you see it. So this is just a little um, complicated cyst and you can see that adding harmonics on really helped clean this up. If the patient has a palpable mass, I would highly recommend that you do this palpation scanning. Um, so what you're going to do here is you're going to place that um, your finger, usually the index finger of the um, right hand, if you're scanning with your left hand, right in front of the uh, transducer. So that's supposed to be a finger right there. And then as you scan down across a palpable area, your finger is going to be right in front of it. And you'll know when the transducer is right over that palpable area, just to show you going like that. Um, I find this really helpful. Um, just to confirm that what you're seeing is absolutely the palpable area. And this can be helpful as well when you're not only feeling masses, but palpable tissue uh, ridges. This is a patient who had what looked like a very normal ridge of tissue on her tangential mammogram and she had an area of concern. And by doing this palpation scanning, as my finger passes across this ridge of echogenic tissue here, I can see that that is what's causing um, her palpable mounty looks totally normal um, and we did not go any further with this. So I guess it's time that we did a little normal breast anatomy. Um, luckily, there really isn't very much anatomy in the breast, so it's not kind of like learning the central nervous system. So on a cross-sectional slice, remember we wanted to see down through pectoralis, starting at the skin. Skin's usually only um, a couple of millimeters thick, it gets thickened in a whole load of processes, both benign inflammatory and neoplastic. This is the uh, fat in the subcutaneous tissue, but uh, anterior to the glandular tissue. And that, as I said, is a mid gray, and it has these echogenic lines going through it, which are the Cooper's ligaments. Behind that subcutaneous fat, and some patients have a lot of it, and some have virtually none of it, is going to be the fibroglandular tissue. This fibroglandular tissue is echogenic, but contains hypoechoic areas, which are both fibrous structures, intervening fat, as well as ductal and periductal structures running through it. And how that looks is going to really depend on how dense the patient's breast parenchyma is, their age, are they lactating, and so on. Then behind that fibroglandular tissue, there's going to be a variable amount of retroglandular fat. You can see it's looking kind of dark here. I should probably increase my gain posteriorly here. And following that is pectoralis. And then behind that, we're going to see the chest wall with the typical rib shadows. 
in um, patients with very thin breasts, sometimes those rib shadows can really fool you and you think that there's a lesion um, and just confirm with your palpation that it's actually a rib. This is an patient who has um, pretty much complete fatty replacement. You can see in this case, yes, we've got the skin, we've got the um, hypoechoic fat here, but we've really got very little echogenic glandular tissue. This is a patient who's lactating. You imagine a mammogram, they would be sort of almost completely opaque through it with very little fatty tissue here. And we can see, you know, behind the skin, there's no preglandular fat. This is all lactating glandular tissue, kind of very homogeneous looking. Sometimes you see prominent ducts within it, um, kind of a mid gray. And then we've got peck at the back here. And you can see here, here's ribs, um, rib shadowing. And here's lung with a typical air artifact with lung back there. I want to go through some of the features of the BIRADS ultrasound lexicon. Similar to mammography and MR, there is a lexicon that we should be using to describe our breast ultrasounds. Now, um, unfortunately, I'm doing this in December 2023 and sometime in early, hopefully early 2024, um, a new version six is expected. Um, I have watched a couple of the lectures that have come round out from people who are on that committee and I've tried to include what appear to be the prominent changes, but um, you may need to check back and I will also probably update this ultrasound at that time. So what is described? Tissue composition, masses, non-mass lesions, and that's a new thing for 2024 calcifications, associated features, special cases, lymph nodes, and then it's given a BIRADS category, the same as um, we do for both MR and mammography in this category is the same. So I'm going to go through most of these in more detail. For the sake of not making this video incredibly long, I'm not going to go over examples of all of these features, but I would highly recommend when the new version comes out that you get the BIRADS atlas as it'll have some great examples within it. There's three categories. They align fairly well with the mammographic tissue composition categories, homogeneous fat, homogeneous fibroglandia, or heterogeneous, which applies to uh, the majority of the studies. There are specific descriptors for masses. We talk about their shape, round, oval, which includes lobulated or irregular. And is their orientation parallel or anti-parallel? So, um, showing here a parallel, usually more benign um, type lesion where the long axis is parallel to the chest wall and then anti-parallel where that long axis is perpendicular to the chest wall. And obviously those are more concerning for malignancy. Continuing on with masses, we talk about the margins. Are they circumscribed or not circumscribed? And if they're not circumscribed, there are some options, indistinct, angular, microlobulated, spiculated, and echogenic rind, which is going to be a new descriptor for the margins in the next BIRADS, in theory. We describe the echo pattern relative to, and this is relative to fat, not the um, parenchyma, as anechoic, hyperechoic, complex cystic and solid, hypoechoic, isoechoic, and heterogeneous. So words that we are pretty uh, familiar with from routine ultrasound. I'm going to be going over complex cystic and solid in a moment. We describe the posterior features. So what happens to the ultrasound beam? So either there's nothing, so it's not affected. The ultrasound beam's not affected by the presence of the mass. It is enhanced, and here's a cyst in a patient, and you can see that increase through transmission or, in, or posterior acoustic enhancement. They can be shadowing. So here's a solid mass in the same patient right next to the cyst and it's shadowing. Or you can have some combination of those patterns. And that usually happens in complex cystic and solid lesions. Mass lesions may also have some other associated features with them. They may distort the architecture. They may extend into a duct or extend into the skin. They can be uh, vascular or avascular, and I'm not going to talk about elastography, but this is one of the associated features. If we see calcifications in the breast, they may be described as within a mass, 
they may be described as outside of a mass within the breast parenchyma, or they may, or we can maybe sometimes see that they are clearly introductal. As I said before, vascularity can be present. There may be vascularity inside of a mass, or there may be vascularity surrounding a mass. Now, echogenic rind is a new descriptor that's coming out or supposed to come out for the, uh, the version six. Um, no, this is distinct from an echogenic pseudocapsule, which we typically see in fibroadenomas, uh, which is uh, much thinner. I'm going to show you an example in a minute. So the echogenic rind tends to be irregular. It's not well demarcated. It's thicker. It can be very variable in thickness. And it can be associated with a mass of any shape, including round, well-circumscribed ones. And when you measure a mass, you should include this echogenic rind in its measurement, as it's been shown pathologically, to be part of the tumor itself. Um, you can also have an echogenic rind associated with non-mass lesions. So here's an example. Here's the echogenic rind. If I was going to kind of draw it out, you see it's irregular. It's sort of not well marginated. I'm having come trouble drawing it. Um, and um, it's variable thickness throughout, where this is a little fibroadenoma, which has an, a beautiful little fine echogenic pseudocapsule associated with it. Another new category that's coming in um, with the next BIRADS are non-mass lesions. And these are this is a new category. Um, it does not have the sort of absolute three-dimensionality of a mass. So mass, you should feel like, you, you know, you should be able to reach in and pluck it out with your fingers. Um, you should be able to see it on two planes. However, it may be primarily vis visible um, in one plane only. So you can see it really clearly in one. You can see it, but not so well in the other. It doesn't have that really clearly definable shape um, and margin to be able to assess it as a mass. And if it's cancerous, it's likely to be in situ. They're going to have specific descriptors. We're also going for non-mass lesions, the same as you did for mass lesions. And um, these are some of the ones that have been um, suggested. Um, so echogenicity, hyperechoic, isoechoic, hyperechoic or mixed, same as for masses. Distribution is going to be different. That's not a um, we don't have margins, don't forget. So we have distribution, regional, focal, linear, segmental, very similar to the MRI uh, categories, it sounds to me. Um, orientation may or may not be in there, um, parallel and anti-parallels I described before, and then very similar associated features to mass lesions. So architecture distortion, calcifications, echogenic rind, shadowing, ductal extension, hypervascularity, and also the presence of small cysts, which is um, one that would be specific to non-mass lesions. There are some special cases that don't really sort of fit into the other categories. One is simple cyst. Um, I tell my residents, you don't have to describe a, you know, oval, anechoic, um, sharply marginated, oval mass, parallel to the chest wall, blah, 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 blah. You just have to say simple cyst. So um, in a simple cyst, just call it a simple cyst. Complicated cyst, we'll talk about in a minute. There's also clustered microcysts, um, intramammary lymph nodes, foreign bodies, including implants, post-op fluid collections, fat necrosis, and skin lesions. So in other words, you're not going to use the previously described BIRADS descriptors for these, they are just are what they are. So just to briefly describe you for cysts, simple cyst um, has no, you know, the usual stuff. It's anechoic, it has a smooth posterior border. It has increased um, through transmission back here. A complicated cyst usually has either low grade um, homogeneous echoes throughout it that may or may not be mobile, um, or it may have a smooth, diffuse, thick rim. Complex cystic and solid has been moved sort of out of cysts and into masses with the new um, birads, and you can see here that we clearly have a mass within this cyst, um, typically a papilloma or a papillary carcinoma, but it doesn't have to be. Clustered microcysts are a benign feature and therefore distension of a dilated terminal ductal lobular unit um, shown here. So here's the normal one and then all those little terminal 
ducts and lobules get distended like this, and here's how it looks like on ultrasound. So it's benign, they can be BIRADS too. There are planned changes to the descriptors for lymph nodes, um, their location. Um, previously, we've just had intramammary or axillary node. We now have added in what uh, level, one, two, or three is the axillary nodes. Don't forget they are in reference to pectoralis minor, and I suggest you look in those up. Superclavicular node, and then the relationship of the cortex to the hilum, and I'm just going to show you um, some examples of that. So as shown here, this is a normal node with thin or almost imperceptible cortex and an echogenic hilum, then you can have the cortex being sort of, you can see it, it's still thin, it's under three millimeters again, that's still normal. The cortex can become diffusely thickened, such as this example over here, um, greater than three millimeters, maybe reactive, maybe due to tumor. You can have lobulations, which are effectively um, uh, making little bumps inside the hilum or external to the cortex with a sort of nice thin cortex over here that's very concerning for metastatic disease. You can have the hilum displaced but still present or completely gone, absent replaced hilum. So these are all uh, very concerning for metastatic disease. So what we're going to do here is just show a few common abnormalities and it's sort of an opportunity to be able to um, use the ultrasound biorides lexicon to describe them. I'm not going to use the full lexicon, I'm just going to use sort of some of the key features here. So this is a mass in an 18-year-old. Um, let's just run through some of our descriptors. Its shape is oval, its orientation is parallel to the chest wall, margins are circumscribed, it's hypoechoic, and there is some increased um, acoustic enhancement going on, we can see behind it, in terms of its vascularity, it's sort of mostly peripheral. And it does also have a thin echogenic pseudocapsule that you can see just there. So this is a classic fibroadenoma. Um, they are usually either oval or have, you know, one or two gentle lobulations. They may be vascular. Um, or they may be avascular, sometimes they're really quite significantly hypervascular, um, but you know they are a very common finding and occasionally they need biopsy to be able to define that further. This is a patient with pretty heterogeneous tissue composition and they have a little mass. You can see in this case it's a round mass. Uh, its orientation, a little difficult to tell, but I would probably you know be moving towards this being anti-parallel. Its margins are not circumscribed, and I would categorize these as being angular. Um, you know, whether you, when you go from angular to spiculated is always a little tough to say, but I would probably count those ones as being angular. It is virtually anechoic, or certainly markedly hypoechoic. Um, there is no increased vascularity. Um, there is no echogenic rhyme, particularly. Um, there is, interestingly, a little increase through transmission, um, and this was a high-grade malignancy. This was a palpable mass in a 45-year-old patient, and the MAMO in this particular case was not particularly helpful. So again, let's think about um, what we're going to say about it. Well, this is kind of an interesting mass. It's, it's oval. It's parallel. It is circumscribed. Is there a little bit of a echogenic capsule? Maybe. Um, so certainly no echogenic rind. Its echo texture is heterogeneous. It has no particular posterior acoustic uh, features, but it does have some internal vascularity. And this um, actually ended up going to biopsy, um, and it was a hamatoma. Um, so it's a typical kind of breast within a breast. It's usually diagnostic on the mammogram, but not in this particular case. Here's another mass, or perhaps, depending on how it looked and you were scanning through, if you're using the new terminology, this, this would be called a non-mass lesion. It certainly becomes very ill-defined, sort of a little bit better defined here. Um, the margins, it's irregular in shape. It has some spiculated margins. Uh, there was some internal vascularity on color Doppler, and there's also these little echogenic foci, which were internal vas 
um, internal calcifications. And we could see those calcifications on the mammogram, even though we couldn't really see the mass. It was a palpable lesion as shown by the BB. And this was another invasive ductal carcinoma. Uh, this ultrasound was done because of a sub very subtle area of architectural distortion um, on a patient's mammogram. And what you could see here was just this, I would definitely call this a non-mass lesion. It's an irregular hypoechoic area. There's maybe a little bit of posterior acoustic shadowing of it. And this was biopsied using ultrasound for guidance, and it turned out to be a radial scar. This was an ultrasound of a um, patient who had mastitis, which was not responding to antibiotics. And this is going to fall into one of those special cases. Um, you know, there is a heterogeneous collection with increased um, peripheral vascularity seen. Um, you know, totally typical of an abscess, whether you're seeing anywhere. So this is a sort of special circumstance. And this is another one. A patient had large dogs that had jumped up on her. She developed a bruise and a palpable mass. And this is very typical appearance for hematomas. Um, usually you can diagnose these um, clinically um, and with ultrasound. You see it tends to have a thick, again, you could call this an echogenic rind with anechoic fluid in the middle, that ratio varies. Um, one of the nice things about hematomas, they change very fast. So um, I will not infrequently do a six week follow up on these, um, by which time it's usually completely resolved. All right, our final section of the talk, yes, the end is in sight, is to talk about some of the pitfalls of breast ultrasound. So here are some of the most common technical pitfalls. Um, you know, there are others. I'm going to go through all these in turn um, and show you some examples of them. As I said before, one of the most common um, problems I find is with uh, people learning ultrasound is they just don't press hard enough. Um, experienced technologist is going to know this. And so you can really make pseudo lesions such as this one here very, very easy by just having shadowing from Cooper's ligaments. So when you see this, you want to press a little bit harder and you can see that it completely goes away with a little bit more compression. Turning the transducer, imaging from different angles can confirm if this is a lesion or not. Obviously, you don't really want to save images into your record for medical legal purposes that look like that. It can be very challenging to look behind the nipple because the nipple itself, um, as well as it may have little air gaps, but it's going to shadow a whole lot and hide stuff behind the nipple or make you think there's a lesion behind the nipple that there isn't. We may be wanting to look behind the nipple because the patient has a palpable mass or they have a mammographic abnormality or they have nipple discharge. And here's some of the ways that you can see behind the nipple. You can put a big gel blob on like here. You can do the two-handed technique, and I'm sorry about my artistic renderings here. But what you're basically doing is taking your left hand and you are flattening the breast against it and imaging from the other side. That's very good. And if you want to see right up into the nipple itself, um, because papillomas can be up in the nipple itself, put your finger on one side of the nipple and roll the nipple over it with a transducer on top. And here's just some examples of um, me trying to image a um, sub areola papilloma, putting a big gel blob on, you know, we can sort of, we can see it, but not great. Um, here's the two handed technique. And we can definitely see that papilloma a little better. And then this is the nipple roll. So this is the nipple up here. And you can see, we see right up into the nipple. Here's my finger underneath making that um, shadowing here. And we get a beautiful image of that little papilloma. Very superficial lesions. And we get um, asked to look at a lot of um, what end up being skin lesions in patients can also be quite challenging um, to image because they're just out of the focal zone of the transducer. Now changing to a 18 megahertz rather than the 12 megahertz transducer can help you. And then there's another couple of options. One is to put a standoff pad. I'm sure you guys have seen these. Um, they're, they're not always that easy to use because they're very slippery. Um, and um, you've sort of got to hold them with one hand. Well, um, using the transducer with the other. So we can use that for superficial lesion, or we can kind of make our own little um, standoff pad by 
um, putting a big blob of gel and then usually putting like your your little finger under the edge of the transducer to just keep it away a little bit. Now, don't forget, whenever you do these, you've got to move the focal zone very anteriorly and you've got to decrease your depth. Just to show you this little superficial lesion in a patient with implants, this is with the 12 megahertz transducer, and you see it pretty well here. And you can see there's really, you know, virtually no breast tissue here, so we're down to one centimeter. Changing to an 18 megahertz, here's our focal zone up here. Um, it definitely improves the resolution of looking at that and really is perfectly adequate. Um, but if you didn't have a 18 megahertz transducer, then consider putting a blob of gel with your finger under it. And you can see here again, we've come right up on our depth. Here's one centimeter here. And we are um, uh, just a little bit off. Here's our gel. You can see that lesion quite well there. Um, we've also taken off a lot of the squash of the... Um, regular transducer. These are all with 18s, by the way. Um, and here's our standoff pad. Now, when, as soon as you put the standoff pad on, you're going to have to move your focal zone down because you have an increased depth. And usually it becomes, the image becomes very bright because it transmits the ultrasound um, energy so well. And so you have to turn your gain down. A potentially very serious problem is non-concordance. In other words, uh, you see something on a mammogram, then you find something with an ultrasound, and you feel it's, you know, it's okay, it's a good, you know, benign cyst, we're done, um, but this actually being a second lesion. So, how do we really ensure concordance? So, before you go into ultrasound, or before you send your tech into ultrasound, you want to be very clear about the size of the lesion, the radian it's at, so the clock face and the distance in the nipple. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about distance from the nipple in a minute. You also want to give them a clue how deep it is in the breast. So we're expecting to see a very superficial lesion. Are we expecting to see it against pect pectoralis and so on? And then what, what does it live in? So what's its surrounding parenchyma? And I'll show you, uh, talk about that a little bit more in a minute. And this is really going to help reduce these things. So if the tech comes back and you're looking for a one centimeter spiculated anterior mass and they show you a five millimeter cyst lying in the mid depth, um, that's not going to be concordant. Um, this is just one little thing that catches people out is distance in the nipple. So if we take this uh, red lesion here, um, you know, say this is six centimeters in the nipple, um, it's going to be six centimeters by mammo and it's going to be six centimeters when the patient's lying down. Um, this is me imagining their, ultras, their mammogram if they were lying down with their arm up. However, if we look at the, the yellow lesion here, that's very different because although, yep, it is definitely also six centimeters from the nipple, when you're scanning them lying down, you're going to see it retro areola and that can really confuse people so just kind of thinking about your images like that can be helpful your lesion orientation will also change between the patient being compressed in their mammogram standing up and lying down with their arm above their head so for example a lesion which is pointing sort of looks like it's going to end up being an anti-parallel lesion on the mammogram may just flatten out and be a parallel lesion. And this is typically true of things like fibroadenomas and cysts, which are mobile and squishable. Here's me trying to show you an example. Here's a little lesion on the CC mammogram, looked like it's directed up towards the nipple, um, but when found by the ultrasound is just lying down and is parallel. Where does your lesion live? So um, it does, is the lesion that you're seeing on the mammogram be within dense parenchyma here, or is it within fatty parenchyma here? That can help you an awful lot in making sure that you're looking at the right lesion, telling the tech, I'm expecting to see an island glandular tissue with this, you know, this abnormality within it if it's there. Going back and reviewing the mammogram can be extremely helpful. Here's something that looks pretty worrisome, you know, it's, it's markedly hypoechoic, even anechoic, lots and lots of shadowing. Uh, I've seen many images um, coming from outside that look like this. But then when you look at the mammogram, it's this big area of fat necrosis, which is shadowing out and is of absolutely no concern. I highly recommend that you make the diagnosis of fat necrosis wherever possible mammographically, because when you start doing ultrasounds, it often looks ugly. Now, I talked about 
um, you making sure that you have adequate pressure so that you're not getting all that ligamentous shadowing. But when the trouble with um, putting too much pressure on the probe is you can actually obliterate the blood flow to superficial lesions. And we often see this in papillomas. And so if I put the perfusion, the, put the color imaging on with my normal pressure, I will also then release the pressure and just make sure that we don't suddenly have that imaging um, being flooded with blood when you do that. This is a little lobulated interductal papilloma and you can see that when pressure was applied, there was no blood flow, took the pressure off, there was blood flow. Um, the color Doppler is on on this image, believe it or not. There is definitely a Goldilocks grayscale setting for every breast and in fact often for every lesion um, which modern machines are really pretty good at doing but there are some times you really need to adjust it and if you've got your gain too high or your gain too low you may either miss things or put artifacts in so this is the same little um, intracystic um, a little um, sorry mass a little bit of wall irregularity maybe with increasing gain, you can see that as, and this is this is our gold locks image here, too low, you're sort of seeing nothing much there, too high, you're putting artificial echoes in it. Um, spatial compounding or sonar CT um, is very helpful. It's, you know, usually it's the default. It's going to make your image much smoother, much less grainy. Um, it helps clear up a lot of cysts, but it does have the disadvantage often in making posterior acoustic um, shadowing less obvious um, and particularly on small lesions and so you might want to flip the spatial compounding on and off this is a little ended up being a, a five millimeter invasive ductal carcinoma a little tiny thing here but when we took and, and there wasn't posterior acoustic shadowing but when we took the spatial compounding off you can see how much more prominent that shadowing is and just as an fyi um, when you put colored doppler on it takes spatial compounding off by default and so that can help you um, just as a sort of quick and easy way of seeing that and then just a final potential pitfall is calling something a mass versus a fat lobule and i think we've all done this um, or we've had you know text bring us in some images of a quote mass or we've looked at them and thought there was a mass there um, because it was a fat lobule which was sort of caught transaxially um, so how can that how can we go in and troubleshoot this? Well, you know, going in and scanning yourself, back scanning um, is going to be the most helpful. Um, it typically has an echogenic line. Um, it typically is compressible more than thirty percent as are uh, lipomas, but not solid mass lesions. So this here on the left was a quote mass that was imaged by a technologist and on the radio image it does look kind of mass like but on the anti-radio you can see it just sort of smudges all out you can see that echogenic line which is so typical of fat lobules and here is just the real-time imaging of this showing that as you scan through it you can see it's clearly a fat lobule it just sort of elongates and joins up with the other fat lobules so that was it. I hope that this has helped you with performing and troubleshooting your breast ultrasound. It really is kind of a fun technique. Um, feel free to add some comments or reach out to me. Goodbye.